Okay. Uh, so I assume you can see the, the screen, if not uh, right through the chat or, or something. I'm I'm Dai Nasip, I'm data scientist at the Fourier cluster in, in Globo. And, and I'm gonna be talking about uh, power analysis. Uh, the, the name of this talk is how long should I run my my A/B test? And it's an introduction to simulation-based power analysis. And um, this is the the outline of the talk. Uh, first of all, we are gonna talk about the the need of uh, power analysis. Then we're gonna discuss the two main methodologies. Uh, and we're gonna deep dive in the simulation based uh, methodology. And finally, we're gonna discuss uh, a Python library. Uh, I'm the main developer of this uh, library and it basically does uh, simulation based power analysis. So if you need to, to do it, uh, you could use that. And also some, some comments about uh, writing an open source library. So here we have an, an experimenter uh, that uh, is, is thinking about running an, an A-B test in, in Globo. Like they, they want to give a promotion to, to new customers and see how many of them or which proportion of them make their uh, first order. So they an experimenter wants to assess the, the impact of this promotion. So they have this metric, which is uh, the, the conversion rate from, from new user to user who has uh, done an order. And, and they, want, they will only give the promotion to a random subset of the users. And we'll see if this random subset of the users uh, has higher conversion than the control set of the users. So the, the experimenter has this question, uh, for how long should I run uh, this test? How, how many promo promotions should I give in order to, to assess uh, if we're uh, having an impact with these uh, promotions? And the, and the point of the length of the, the experiment is statistical significance. The, the idea being that if you have very few data, then you're probably not gonna be able to detect uh small changes but if you have like a massive data set you, you give the promotions to all new users in global during a year then uh, in, in, a, in a random manner uh, you run the data test for a very big market in a very long time then you're going to be able to measure very very small differences so yeah the, that, that's the question how long should i run my AD test and, and this is in order to detect significant significant differences and the obvious answer is uh, the longer the, the better, but this is a bit, uh, stupid actually. It's like if I run a very long experiment, then I can measure any kind of uh, differences that exist due to the, the treatment, but we don't have an infinite amount of, of time. Uh, you know, we. We, we set up our projects sometimes in a quarterly basis. So, so we have a, a limited amount of time. And then we have, if we have very short experiments, we can run lot of, lots of experiments. And if we have very long experiments, we can run very few experiments. So the idea is uh, not to detect anything, uh, but just what, what you care about. And, and the idea is to have a long enough experiment that you can detect what changes that you care about. And we're gonna discuss that later. And the second wrong answer, this is uh, how, of this question of how long should I run my AB test is, it depends. It depends on the data you have. And now we're, we're, we're gonna see what does it depend on. And, and the, the, the most obvious one is the amount of data per day. So if you have lots of data uh, per day, then you're gonna, be running a short experiment are you gonna, and you're gonna get enough data for significance. This is uh, not very controversial. The second one, I think it's a bit more, more interesting. Uh, so basically the length of our A-B test depends very much on the effect that we're interested in measuring. And, and if, we're inter in, if we're only interested in massive effects, 
then we can do with a very sure experiment. Because like in a we, unless the effect is massive, uh, we we're not going to see differences in the in the treatment and control data. But if we're interested in a in a very small effect, then we probably need to run the experiment longer. So so this is two things that uh, are, are the, the the main things that take uh, that, that are important here. So is the, the amount of data that you have and the fact you're interested in measuring. And, and then there are other things like the distribution of the of, of the data, mainly the, the, the variance of the data is, is, is what is uh, of the outcome of interest is what is important. Uh, then what kind of hypothesis test you're running, um, which is the desired statistical significance. So 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 all of these are are relevant. But but I think that the most important to understand are the, the two first ones. Because because and, and all of these can be summarized into a quantity called uh, power. And and if we if we go to the Wikipedia definition, then we see that the power of a hypothesis test is the probability uh, to correctly re reject the null hypothesis when a specific alternative hypothesis is true. And this is to me super hard to remember exactly, but I, I, I think another way to to put it that is very similar is the probability of detecting an effect if there is a given real effect. So, uh, and the idea is that you want your uh, A-B test uh, to, to, to be powerful, to have high power, because if a test has high power, it means that if there is actually a difference, uh, a significant, like a difference between your treatment and control data, your test is going to be able to detect this. Test. This is like a natural thing that, that is desired. Uh, of, of A-B tests that they have high power. So if there are real differences, we want to be able to uh, measure these differences. And, and, and then I was saying that we need A-B tests with high power, but, but this doesn't really make any sense. So the, the, the claim, my experiment has 80% power is, is actually non nonsensical. So what, what is well-defined is uh, the power to detect an average effect. So, so the, the claim, my experiment has 80% power to detect an effect of 0 0.1 in the average treatment effect. This is well, well defined. And, and here we can see that the, the thing I was mentioning some slides ago that the effect we're interested in measuring is very related uh, with, with power. And, uh, a, a way to formalize it, this is to have a, a function. Uh, power is a function of the of the real effect, and, and we can see that if power is big enough, uh, if if the effect is is big enough, we we're gonna be having very very high uh, power. So uh, that that makes sense, right? If 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 your differences between your treatment and control data are are, are huge, your almost always gonna be able to, to detect these differences. If, you're, if the differences between your uh, treatment and control data are very, very tiny, uh, you are less likely to detect these differences with, with an hypothesis test. And actually, if there are no differences, if the treatment and control data have, have been generated uh, with the same distribution, uh, the power should be the type one error of the hypothesis test. And, and this is what, when, when people talk about AA tests, this is what they do. They, they, they verify that indeed when there are no differences, uh, the, the, the power of, of, of the hypothesis test uh, is the type one error of, of the test. Um, yeah, so here we have power as a function of the average Simon effect. But actually, it not only depends on the average semen effect; it only depends on, on the it also depends on the on the experiment length. So basically, uh, three three weeks experiment for the same effect, uh, we're going to be having higher power than a two week uh, experiment. And and these already, if we're able to draw these power lines uh, for every experiment length, we're able to draw a power line. We already have a methodology. To, to decide the experiment length. And the methodology is, is the following. So basically you, you define an, 
average steam and effect that you're interested in, in detecting. And you're like, this is the minimum uh, average effect that I'm interested in measuring. Let's say in, in this case, it's 0 0.05. This, uh, if we're thinking about proportions, uh, half percent to point. And then you also need to define a level of power. And you're going to be saying, I'm, I'm on, only happy with an experiment where I am able to detect uh, the significant differences for uh, this uh, average semen effect around 60% of the times. If it's 40% of the times, then I'm not happy with that. If it's 60, it's enough. And then you basically uh, take the experiment length such that you have enough power. Here is two weeks. Uh, so with two weeks, uh, for this average semen effect, we, we can detect 60% of the times significant differences. Um, and then this should be the length of our experiment. If we run a longer, this is like the minimum length that we need uh, for this uh, minimum detectable effect and, and power uh, to, to get this uh, power of this minimum detectable effect. If you were interested only in measuring uh, bigger effects, like 1% uh, to a point, you would, it would be enough uh, with one week. And if you were interested in very small effects, like 0.3% to a point, you would need three weeks later. So this, this already gives us a way to decide experiment length. But the big question left, and this is what this all the rest of the talk um, is, is going to be about, is how to actually draw these uh, lines. So this is the second section of the talk, the power analysis methodologies. And, and just uh, to a bit of uh, summary of, of how this works, uh, basically power estimations, uh, you do them on the experiment design phase. You, you do them before running the experiment because uh, the goal of, of power estimation is to give you an idea of the experiment length that you need. And then what you would do in general is to use data prior to the to experiment. So for instance, in here to draw the blue line, we would take um, the last week before the experiment and then draw this line uh, with the last week of data. And the orange line would be with the two last weeks of data and the green line with the, the three last weeks of data. So this is uh, how we're gonna do it. And, and now I'm going to explain how do we use this last one week of data, last two weeks of data, or, or three in order to draw these lines. So basically, the, the way that is most widely used is uh, exact power calculations. Um, and, and there are even online calculators that allow you to, to do it. You, you tell them, I have. Uh, these many visitors in A, these conversions, these uh, visitors in B, these conversions, you apply the changes and it tells you the, the power. So you could draw the line uh, by going to this online calculator. But even if, but, but even if you don't have the online calculator, it, there are like Python libraries, and other languages that, that have this, uh, analytical calculations and, and and the issue with this so so basically these are uh, these are formulas that are implemented in the online calculator or in the python library and and, and the issue is uh, that getting these formulas is not very straightforward so basically you need very deep knowledge of the hypothesis test and i must myself i'm not an expert in in statistics, so this 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 is super uh, troublesome to me. Every time I need to do a new exact ca power calculation, I uh, start like uh, sweating. Uh, and and there, are, so basically for the simple case that you have an A B test, 50-50 split, and 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 you are going to do a T test to compare the means. Then uh, you can use your Python library, your online calculator. Uh, it's, it's it's very easy and, and super handy. The issue is uh, there are some cases where this is not that straightforward anymore. So one one that is actually not that hard uh, is when there's some imbalance. So only a fraction of users get treatment B, and the others get control. So this is very common in in A/B testing, and and this you can 
still do it's not that hard uh, but uh, but you, you need to understand a little bit the, the power expression then if you add covariates to the hypothesis test uh, then this gets harder to do with an analytical expression so we we sometimes add covariates in global to reduce the variance of the test and to uh, have a shorter experiment uh, so this is not that that easy anymore if you have cluster design, I think that in Lobo we have lots of cluster design. So for instance, the, the, the main example is we apply some treatment in some cities, in other cities uh, we don't, and we and we measure the differences between the cities that we apply the treatment and the ones that we didn't. And I don't think this is only a logistics thing. I think customers also have kind of cluster designs because um, they apply treatments to customers but uh, measure the differences at session level um, and this is basically a cluster design so so this if you need to derive an analytical uh, expression uh, for the power of the cluster design uh, well good luck it's it's not that easy um then then you can if you do bootstrapping uh, as the hypothesis test, like you want to compare two mediums, for instance, bootstrapping is the is the, the general way to, to do it. So yeah, the, deriving a power expression for bootstrapping is not that easy. And, and this is also a very common one where treatment only acts effectively in a percentage of the population. Like it, it, it only acts, uh, so promotions don't work for every, uh, user, uh, so if you're me measuring the average of the value or something like that, uh, they are only going to be affected by the users that actually uh, use the, the promotion. So this, I don't really know how to encode this in, in this analytical power calculations. So if you are lazy and don't know much about statistics like me, like you can do this one size fits all solution, which is simulation-based simulation power calculation. And the good thing about this is that you need no knowledge of the um, hypothesis test. You, you need to know uh, no math almost, uh, just run simulations. And the main issue, um, the main issues is that one, it's slow. So the other one is just a formula uh, Python can compute uh, power for, I don't know, a hundred uh, experiment lengths and uh, a thousand uh, different minimum detectable effects in a second, but this is slower. Uh, so every power calculation takes seconds. Uh, and if you need to, to try with different experiment lengths and different uh, minimum detectable effects, then it, it gets very, very slow but it's parallelizable. All of these can be done in parallel. Uh, so if you have a cluster of computers or something, you can make it fast. And then there are also more, more sources of, of error. You're doing simulation and estimating via simulation. And this, this has uh, some, some sources of error. And um, okay, so now we're going to be deep diving on, on what this simulation-based power analysis uh, thing is. And, and here is how it works. So, so take a look at the figure here below. Uh, we, we're going to be doing what we have in this figure a lot of times. And the idea is that, uh, as I was saying before, you take the data uh, of, I don't know, n weeks before the experiment, and, and this will give you an, an estimate of uh, power uh, for these n weeks. Then you split this data as you would do in the experiment. So you split, you, you assign randomly some of the data to treatment B, you assign to some of the data to treatment A. And then for the data assign, assigned in, in treatment, you create like synthetic data where you uh, modify the data by adding an effect. And this gives you some. This gives you some simulated data. Now you run an hypothesis test uh, with the si simulated data from B and the real data from A, and then you see if you reject or accept. And then you, you can. This gives you like uh, for 
one step of the simulation, one rejection or acceptance. And then you, you repeat this like, I don't know, 100 times, and you see how, how many times you, you're actually rejecting your null hypothesis. And this is an estimate of the power. And I mean, it makes sense, right? We, we, we've uh, split the data, added the effect, and run the hypothesis test. This should give us an idea of, uh, of how much power do we have with this data, adding this effect, and running this hypothesis test. So here we have, and that's why I was saying that this has more errors, because if you run this very few times, then uh, your estimate of the power is very bad. If you run this I don't know, 10,000 times, then you have better and more stable estimates of the, of the power. And this is why I was saying that this is a slow, because actually every estimation of the power needs to run this process 100 times or like n times. That n shouldn't be very, very low, it should be 100 at least. And if your hypothesis test is, is expensive to run, like a bootstrap uh, hypothesis test, then this starts to get very, very slow. And this is just the pseudo code uh, for, for this power calculator. Uh, you pass it an average semen effect, some pre experimental data. Uh, uh, type one error and the number of simulations that you want to run, and you split data in A and B, you add the treatment effect in B, you get the p-value uh, running the hypothesis testing here and check if the p-value is smaller than the type one error. This basically means that you're rejecting, and, and then you compute power as the average of the reject rejections. So this is uh, super simple and, and this is what the library implements. We're going to be talking about that later, but it basically implements this function in a convoluted manner because we need uh, users to define their own ways to split, add effects, get the p-values. So, but, but in the end, what it does is this function. And then the idea is, is to try to replicate as much as possible uh, what's going to happen in the experiment. So you should split your data as you're gonna do in your experiment. So if you are stratifying for some reason, uh, like uh, ensuring that users of different countries get the same, uh, the same proportion of treatments, then you need to do this in the simulation. If you are doing like a cluster splitting, like you're splitting some cities in treatment A and some cities in treatment B, um, you need to account for that on the on the splitter. The idea is to reprodu reproduce as much as possible what's going to happen in the real experiment. Then uh, adding the the effect. Uh, this this is like the second part of of this simulation. Uh, you, you should replicate how the effect is going to change uh, the observations in in reality. So, for instance, if you have a binary variable. Uh, so if a user converts it or, or not, uh, then you should transform zeros to ones or, or ones to zeros. Uh, you shouldn't like add the average difference because a user converted 0 0.2 doesn't make sense. Users either convert or not convert. And then you should, this is pretty obvious, you should run the same hypothesis test um, that you're gonna run uh, after you collect your data. And this is actually like a nice feature of, of this because you already have your data, your, you already have your, your code uh, ready for the uh, post-experimental part uh, as you should replicate what has happened in the, in the power analysis. Okay, and now we're gonna discuss some of the shortcomings that um, we had with the, um, with the exact power analysis. So basically, when we had imbalance in the simulation-based power analysis, we can, we can split with imbalance. Uh, when we wanted to add covariates to the hypothesis test, uh, we, can add, uh, we, we can run the same test that we're going to run uh, when we have the data in the power analysis. Uh, for, for cluster designs, we should do both uh, split the split the clusters, like uh, split in the same way that we're gonna split in the experiment and use cluster standard errors uh, when uh, running the hypothesis test. 
for bootstrapping, pretty obvious. Uh, we're going to run uh, bootstrapping in the hypothesis uh, test. And if our treatment, we, we think that it only impacts a percentage of the treated population, uh, we, we should only add effect to, to this percentage. And now, uh, for the last uh, 10 minutes, we're going to be talking about the power analysis uh, library. Uh, this is a library that, as I've said, implements the previous uh, loop. Uh, it's open source, it's, it's on, on GitHub, and, and this is the Hello World. And, and the Hello World is, is basically defining a configuration of how you want to run this, this simulation. So you want um, you know, uh, 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 ordinary least squares uh, analysis, hypothesis test. You want to perturb your data, like add the treatment to your data uniformly, and you want a non-clustered, like a regular splitter. You want to split your data in A and B randomly for each observation. And then you just run the, you just run the power analysis uh, function with a data frame and an average effect. And the name of the library is super bad. It's called Cluster Experiments because it started as a library to do power analysis on cluster uh, designs, but actually it can be used for, for any kind of, of design. And what, what, what does it bring? Uh, so, so I think some cool things that you can do with the library. So you can do uh, regular splitting, like just AB splitting, uh, imbalance splitting, assigning treatment to 10% of the population, certified splitting, ensuring that uh, treatment and control uh, are 50-50 in some uh, stratas of the population. And you can also do cluster uh, splitting, like you can do this assign cities to A and B. You can do uniform uh, perturbation and binary. The binary is what I was commenting before, transforming ones to zeros or zeros to ones. And then there are some analysis tests like ordinary least square, cluster ordinary least square, generalized estimating equations, and cluster D test. Um, and then you can, this is, I'm super proud of this. Uh, you can do variance reaction with uh, CUPAC. And, and, and if you want to do CUPAC, which is basically creating a super good covariate that allows you to reduce the variance of the experiment. And this super good covariate is built with a ML model, a machine learning model. Uh, then you can use any scikit-learn machine, le machine learning uh, class uh, that does regression or classification in here. Uh, so this, this I think, uh, gives a lot of freedom to the users of the library. Um, and it's easily customizable, and now we're gonna we're gonna see that uh, if if there are some class that are not implemented, like you have your bootstrap hypothesis test that is not implemented in here, you can create your own, and it's uh, gonna work. Um, then it has online documentations with lots of toy examples, and it's extensively unit tested. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. Basically, what, what, what if an hypothesis test is not in the library, uh, then all you need to do is create your own uh, custom experiment analysis. You can name it whatever you want, but it should uh, derive from the experiment analysis. This is an abstract class. Uh, and, and this abstract class has this abstract method, this analysis p-value that should take a data frame and return a, and return a number between zero and one. And all that you should do is perform the hypothesis test and return the p-value. So uh, if a hypothesis test is not in the library, you just uh, write it, put it in the power analysis, and it's going to work. If a splitter is not in the library, then the same. Uh, you create your custom random splitter that should inherit from random splitter, should have this uh, assigned treatment DF method. I'm sorry about this name, it's really bad. And it should take a data frame and return a data frame with a new column that has the treatment. And if your perturbator is not in the library, you should create your you could you can create your uh, custom perturbator uh, or whatever you want to name it that should only have this perturbate method that should receive a data frame and return a data frame with uh, the treated data perturbator. So this is also super um, 
easy to do. You set it in the power analysis and it's gonna work. I, the, the library was thought at the beginning for the cluster case um, and, and it has lots of clustering stuff. So basically if you wanna run, uh, if you wanna set any kind of columns that you want as, as clusters in your experiment, you can uh, use that and the splitter and the cluster splitter is gonna take care of that. And the GE is gonna use this uh, set of columns as, as, as clusters too. And then it works with the exact same, exact same interface. And um, yeah, I'm I'm finishing. So some things that I think work in this uh, in the start of the work in this library, and it's that option with the with the users is starting the readme with a hello world example. People can just copy paste this hello world example and start tweaking it for their own use case. And I think it it's this is much more appreciated than having to read the internal documentation. Then I think uh, I started this uh, three three months ago, and I'm still engaged with this because it's a library I use every week or so. So uh, I, I think this can be very engaging. Writing something that you that you use, uh, I, I think it has been relevant to to empower users and to allow them to customize the uses of the of the library, and. And also, you can unit test your your docs in Python, like check the that the docs, uh, the examples in the docs run. This is super easy to do in Python, and and people are gonna copy paste things from the docs. So it's it's a very good uh, user experience that everything that they copy works, and and otherwise it's very bad user experience. Um, some things that I didn't do well, um, the library name. Uh, this is. Uh, super bad cluster experiments uh, it should be something like power analysis, and um, and then I think I should have invested more on an initial design of the library. I did some breaking changes at some point because uh, I didn't like the the, the way uh, the splitter class was was implemented, um, and then I had to inform users that I don't really know who uses it, so I had to put them all together in a Slack group and tell them, hey, this this is going to change. We're going to have breaking changes. Uh, you should start calling it calling your uh, methods that way. And then some things that I, I haven't managed to, to succeed, I think, uh, well, the first one I'm going to do at some point to develop the exact power analysis, because there are lots of exact power analysis, like analytical power analysis users. Then I, I was working in the experimentation analytics library, uh, intern the internal one in Globo. And and I literally copy pasted uh, some code from, from this cluster experiments library. And yeah, this is just uh, a bad software practice, but I, I didn't really know how to do it otherwise. Uh, so we have now duplicated code. And then I think I've uh, succeeded in, in, in having users. Like uh, every week someone writes to me uh, asking, hey, how does this work? Uh, but I don't have many contributors, I think uh, one or, or two. So uh, I haven't succeeded in, in people like uh, participating in, in improving the library. And I don't have a scalable way, a scalable way to communicate with uh, users and no way to track who uses it. Like uh, PyPy tells me that uh, I have 6,000 uh, downloads. I, I really doubt that I have 6,000 users. Um, and when I do changes, I don't really know uh, who I should tell, uh, and I have no channel for, for doing it. So if, if you have recommendations, I'll be, I'll be happy. Um, yeah, uh, so three takeaways, um, and we can jump to questions. Uh, I guess the first one is obvious, uh, use power analysis uh, to, to help you in assessing the experiment line. If you have a simple use case, go with the formulas. They are super fast and, and work well. And then for others, you can use uh, simulation and the cluster experiments library. And I think this is it. If you have any questions, let me know. Thanks a lot, David. Actually, for the like building communities in open source is super difficult. But there is something that may be interesting for you in Mozilla. They offer a open leadership uh, course 
which talks about community and creating accessible libraries. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's super interesting. I pasted in the chat the library for everyone that is interested. So you have you. a GitHub link there. Uh, we have a question from Nick. Isn't Python language slow for simulations? Um, yeah, but uh, I, I I actually think the 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 bottleneck of these uh, simulations is uh, running the hypothesis test usually. So and and the hypothesis test is actually usually implemented. It's a Python library, but the, like the backend or something is in C. So um, I, I think that uh, speeding up is is hard because the the bottleneck is actually not not in not in Python. Uh, and I, and yeah, I guess one issue is that this can be easily parallelizable, but but Python is not great for par parallelization. Yeah. And um, SQL implementation, I, I for sure don't, do not know uh, enough SQL to start with, with any of this. But I, I, I guess it, it can be done. Have you considered to push this like open source from global? Because maybe like what Nick, has, uh, Nick says, right? Like it's easier maybe to find first contributors within the company, which can help. Uh, uh, what do you mean? Like right now, just post it from your own user and uh, yeah, 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 to 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 put it in the in the global. Uh, so I'm thinking if if global can offer you the repo and can offer you the support for contributions and knowledge for you, right, to build on that library, which we are using internally. So yeah, I I I guess I I really haven't started uh, to to talk about. Uh, global with this because I really don't know how I should incorporate it in the global GitHub and and it was just easier uh, to start by myself. Mm -hmm. Let me reach out to you then with that okay. because with that I can help you. More questions, more questions about uh, the project that David was exposing or even about A/B testing. Anybody in the room? All right. Um, All right. Since there so, are no questions, thank you very thank much. Thank you. Uh, 